After a spectacular run of record highs recently for the S&P 500 and the Nasdaq, the big question is, are we now at an inflection point that could well see some lower lows coming up? Or is it just a road bump in the road for those that want to take the market higher? We've seen a peak in volatility as well recently. Let's uh, take a look at the chart before we take a look at uh, this in the context with our guests. I want to go first of all with the S&P 500, where we've seen, as I say, these record highs in the longer term picture. Uh, we go back to uh, the level down here back in uh, September uh, last year, uh, where we've seen these higher highs peak out with that recent record for the S&P 500. But at the same time, we've got to be mindful of the way in which the volatility has been uh, moving sideways uh, since April this year until this peak that we've seen uh, crest out recently. Now, what's all this mean uh, for the markets? We're joined now by technical analyst Ron William from RW Advisory. Ron, welcome. Certainly an interesting time. And when we uh, spoke to you about uh, getting you back on the platform to explain this in terms of some of your charts, uh, you were talking about a Minsky moment. Um, just explain what's going on as you see it in the markets at the moment. Yes, well, Minsky moment named after the, the, the famous economist that formed the term based on a surprise collapse in the market when we least expect it. And it's based on the premise that unsustainable bull markets fueled by easy credit uh, can often sow the seeds of their own demise uh, just through excessive sp speculation and, and the general irrational exuberance um, th that is imprinted um, at that moment in time. And certainly it, it seems as this uh, bull continues to be very, very long in the tooth, even on my own cycle metrics, uh, that we're seeing ever more uh, asymmetric risk signs uh, where risk management is really prudent at this at this time. What do you say then about uh, the S&P 500? Do, go back to the chart if we can very briefly. And uh, you asked us to draw this uh, this trend line on this trend line resistance uh, right up to the recent highs. Um, uh, is, is your main thesis that this is the beginning then of a market collapse as described by Minsky? Yes, well, this is where we can combine the blend of, of technical and uh, macro. And certainly here we can see just a simple uh, but impactful uh, uh, uptrend line, uh, which is being cited uh, in the press and with traders alike, um, that, that there is uh, uh, overhead pressure uh, just from a, a, a historical price point. Uh, later on in our discussion, um, I'll connect not just the highs with the highs, but the lows with the lows and speak about this rare broadening pattern, which is what I'm calling the technical Minsky moment. What about the volatility index? Let's switch on to this because I think this is interesting as well. Uh, along with these uh, record highs, we've seen this sideways move uh, that we've had. And you've asked again for this box to be drawn on. Uh, we have peaked recently. We're just um, at the peak a couple of days ago um, at the highs not seen since, uh, since June this year. Um, are you surprised at how relatively little this moved or are you indicating here particularly something that you want to pull out from this as to give us an idea as to where things are going to move from this point? Uh, studying volatility uh, is very important and it's a big part of uh, my kind of non-correlated uh, framework um, and, and certainly volatility is one of those uh, best examples of uh, a data set that, that mean reverts and, and has this constant change pattern. And if you recall, Jeremy, in previous discussions that we've had, I often called that pattern the calm before the storm, where basically we get a, a compression volatility, then a snap up, compression volatility and a snap up. And that's that has existed ever since 2018 and, and allowed me to actually predict uh, more often than not uh, timely uh, breakouts in volatility. We're now seeing the same thing again, history rhyming with that rhythmic uh, volatility uh, mean reversion signal. And that range on the on the IG VIX uh, chart that you just showed there um, shows the range uh, with the ceiling at 40 percent, which we um, actually just tested uh, once again for the third time uh, last week when we had that mini uh, shakeout. So traders really should be watching this uh, as, as a breakout level to come. If we do break 50, uh, 40 percent um, uh, and higher uh, in, in, in the coming weeks and months, particularly now that we've broken into the negative seasonality of September onwards, I have a chart uh, at the very end uh, just, just to visualize uh, that, that timing, um, then we this is the time to actually be uh, looking for further volatility. 
Let's, let's, let's move on to the, the charts that you've uh, produced, the, the, the graphic representation of uh, the way you see things. And in fact, we can see from here in the uh, top right and bottom right hand corners, you've got there the volatility index and the S&P 500. But I want to begin, first of all, if we can, to uh, take a look at um, the this this fear and greed index, as you have before so uh, well described. And you've illustrated it here uh, with this put to call uh, chart that you've got. Um, we're bringing in here some interesting um, market um, angles on this. And we're, we're talking here about the options market. And that's actually quite complicated for some people to understand. Um, but just if you can break it down to explain just what this chart is telling us and, and how it sets you up for your thoughts on where things are about to go. Well, for seasoned uh, option uh, traders and investors alike, they'll know that the put-call ratio is, is the equivalent of a long, short strategy, but as expressed in, in the, bond, in, in the uh, options market. Now, from a behavioral standpoint, um, this it basically shows us sentiment of fear and greed and the, and the best way to add context to that is is the uh the, the peak and uh, that that we saw in the equity market in um in february going into march where we actually had the whole uh, market top and then covid 19 uh, pandemic situation that was clearly driven by fear and that's why we have a spike in march on this chart uh, during that time and now the pendulum has swung uh, from fear uh, just into the pandemic of early this year, 2020, into extreme greed measures. Um, and that's why we have it uh, bottoming at the low. So this is the net difference between the, uh, the uh, put and call option a strategy equivalent of a long and short, and essentially shows that a lot of people are um, taking out call options, i.e. they're hedging for upside uh, potential um, in, in the equity market, specifically in the NASDAQ tech-driven sector. Uh, which has clearly been the most attractive and sexy uh, in, in recent times. Uh, but that's money that needs to be made in the near term. The market has to hold record highs for people to be in the money. Otherwise, um, of course, you know, the premium would be the risk factor on that. Now, anecdotally, um, irrational exuberance has already been reported just in the last few days, um, I think by the Wall Street Journal and Financial Times, this so-called Nasdaq whale, SoftBank uh, conglomerate uh, in Japan, taking out a position of 4 billion US dollars um, on the derivative markets. And that's showing you how big money and so-called smart money is actually taking a big call option on some of the tech stocks and I believe also on single name stocks. Uh, so it really just shows the amplification effect or as George Soros would say, the reflexivity risk um, that we now um, have in the market. And that's also supported by not just big smart money uh, whale positions, such as the one that uh, uh, Afa mentioned, but also small retail money uh, at the margin uh, reaching extremes not seen in the last 20 years in terms of the same data set, but for small retail money. So big or small, uh, we, we're seeing excessive irrational exuberance as measured by volatility and put call ratios in the market. Yeah, just um, moving on to the second chart, uh, you, you talk here about uh, some of the tech stocks. We've actually uh, spoken about techs before and uh, how the FANG index uh, relates to the rest of the market. Um, there's this uh, divergence that is, has, has, been, has been going on. Um, do you see this continuing or uh, is, is the moment over now for techs? Well, this is the greater full theory classic signal uh, live in process and, and these are precarious to to time in terms of market top although i do think that, that this is a high asymmetric risk of a market top in place um, and and the reason why just go back to the precariousness of of, of, of timing this is because of the fang fantastic uh, divergence as I've been calling it uh, recently and so th these these are the momentum uh, tech driven stocks that have just had phenomenal gains on the upside we have seen a shakeout of course on single stock names uh, such as um, Apple um, and Tesla uh, more specifically and so that's that's a warning shot I think to to people not to get too overconfident uh, from a behavioral standpoint what we can see here on this chart is is the internal divergence and reality on the ground. And you can see that the black line is showing you the tech fang divergence, but the red line is showing you 
equal weighted S&P 500. And I really urge investors and traders alike to be watching internal indicators like equal um, uh, trade weighted index, because this shows you the real movement in the market, not the skewed, amplified, banged, atastic divergence, but the real movement. And the real movement shows that the S&P 500, if you take out the tech stocks, uh, just for intellectual purposes and, and just to see how much of a divergence there is, you can see that the index has been flat since June and has actually failed to break above the June high, let alone uh, the all-time uh, record high set in Feb. Uh, this can be seen more clearly if you look at the um, what I call the um, Tech Street, Wall Street and Main Street indices, NASDAQ, S&P 500 and Russell 2000, you'll see clearly NASDAQ is, is close to 30% above its record highs, S&P 500 is under 10% and Russell 2000 is actually negative um, under uh, its, its record high uh, just below the June peaks as we saw on the equal weighted index there on the S&P 500. So there is a good, a relative good, bad and ugly story even in this record uh, uh, new high breakout uh, territory. OK, I just want to reference another stock. You mentioned Apple. I want to bring up a, a stock chart of Tesla, if I can, because uh, this just exemplifies what's been happening. And we do have, um, if you forget the pun on this particular occasion, a road bump. Uh, and of course, the big question is, there, is there much more to go down for techs? This is the thing, assuming Tesla is a tech stock. And of course, it's been lumped together in that area. And this is a, a new technology in that regard. Um, do, do, you, do you see techs being the most affected by the suggestion that markets are going to drop um, uh, from this point on, do you see a disproportionate um, uh, uh, short call on some of these tech stocks as being the best play? Well, potentially for the more aggressive and brave traders out there, but I think generally speaking, it would likely be either uh, deleveraging off existing trades where a lot of people actually have made phenomenal gains. So how about taking some of the profit um, and deleveraging, so taking risk off the table as, uh, alongside the profit. Um, otherwise, uh, as you just mentioned, those who want to ride uh, the rip on the downside as they did on the upside, um, that is possible, although I would say that that would be a precarious uh, risk reward uh, setup. More uh, interestingly, people might rotate from a, a, a risk on uh, portfolio to a risk off and potentially look at uh, other proxies in the market, maybe uh, the border index or, or maybe just rotating to more defensive stocks. So uh, it's, 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 it's really a choice. The other thing, of course, is we've got um, safe haven plays such as gold, uh, maybe some of the uh, currency space uh, also um, to, to keep in mind. Let's, uh, let's move on and, and reference uh, this Minsky moment, if we can, and uh, pick up on your, your next slide that you've got. Uh, you, you explained a little bit more about it at the beginning as to what it is, but I think this gives us a little bit more sort of depth and understanding. Um, explain where you think we are about to go based on this moment of inflection. So this is the, the more timely uh, uh, chart that really does speak a thousand words. There's a little bit of noise on there, as is uh, customary with, with some of my charts. Uh, but this Minsky moment chart shows the technical setup, which could translate into uh, an imminent uh, market collapse. Um, and that would fit in not just with the technical, but with the uh, uh, cycle, the timing, uh, seasonality side of things, which, which I've, I've prepared some final charts uh, in our discussion on. Uh, but essentially, that upper trend line that you draw at the very beginning of our interview, Jeremy, is what you see on this chart between point one, uh, three and five. But point two and four show you that you can connect the highs with the highs and the lows with the lows. And that is a classic rare technical pattern called a broadening uh, pattern formation. Now, this often um, uh, appears only in uh, in rare late cycle uh, situations like the ones that we're in now, it shows excessive volatility because if you think about it from a demand supply or buying selling pressure, um, you've got massive disagreement in the market. Buyers are making higher highs, uh, sellers are making lower lows. And as each swing is formed from one higher high to the next lower low, you're just getting this expansion of volatility and, and, you know, and, and that just becomes a self-feeding uh, uh, setup. 
until you actually hit 0.5, and 0.5 is deemed the kiss of death, you know, as far as the technical setup goes. Um, and if we actually break below um, a trigger level of 33, 34, that's the previous record high set in Feb this year. That would be probably my early stage downside trigger. Um, and then below that, uh, the 3000 level, randophobia level uh, from, from before. But ultimately, if you look at the uh, pricing uh, statistical work on the left, um, I've got a big price drop risk between 2890 and 2070. That's a 820 point drop. That's one of the reasons why I use the statistical uh, measures to actually not just look for key price levels, but also what I call price vacuum levels, where you're going to get massive acceleration up or down. In this case, just as we accelerate it up, uh, we've got a, a very high likelihood of, of doing the same, but on the downside. Um, and if you uh, then look at the uh, lower uh, boxes on this chart, it just shows you the timing indicators based on proprietary cycles that I look at. There's a, there's a cluster of cycles coming in from late September um, into uh, year end, but more specifically late September into the US elections. Um, and then at the very bottom, it just shows a volatility indicator uh, which has hit an overbought signal um, and suggests that this V-shaped recovery that so many people have been um, uh, committed to uh, may actually be false and rolling into a W-shaped retest of the crash lows. How does all this fit in with what one might regard as a, a roadmap investment cycle, I think, which you have now got on your next chart, which you refer to? Yes, yeah, so we feature this in, in prior discussions just to give a little bit more of an educational visual framework uh, to, to the audience out there. Uh, many are, are looking for some kind of reference to, to for you know what we're experiencing right now in the market. And so the roadmap investment cycle that we can see here on the, on the screen, um, originally developed by my mentor, Mr. Robin Griffiths, um, is based on the business cycle, but it's showing you the boom bust fractal uh, shape of, of that business cycle. Um, and in the final late stage, you can see there in the traffic light uh, color system on the top, um, we get this market top bear correction. And that is a process, a three stage process, uh, uh, lettered W, X and Y. Um, and and the, the actual price pattern is a fall rally rest of fall. Now, the big issue um, uh, that I've had and, and certainly many of my clients and, and people that I know in the market is actually, you know, being able to gauge this transition late cycle into uh, what could be a potential uh, multi-year reset. It's still not clear as to how that will play out. But what seems to be um, uh, more clear now is that this WXY uh, setup may actually be taking effect right now if we're looking at the um, uh, real price action, i.e. equal weighted index of the S&P 500, where it has already failed to break above the June peak, let alone all time highs. And that's showing you the real internal price action when you take out central bank activity uh, and then all this excessive speculative um, uh, leverage in, in tech sector. If you look at the real action based on equal weighted index and also some of the European and even the UK market, which have been negative year to date, um, we do have a lower high in place and a potential rest of fall to come. And this is essentially uh, the educational framework for a Minsky moment set up um, within, a, within a technical cycle picture. Because we have to remind ourselves that uh, this time of year, September is notoriously a, a, a negative month uh, for, for many markets. Um, and of course, uh, we've got the uh, month last week starting off with those relatively spectacular uh, losses. Um, what about the fall crash cycle? Where is this going to take us out for the rest of the year? Yes, well, the, the sweet spot for this baby cycle, which really does matter and, and it is really important for uh, more precise market timing, uh, the sweet spot is between late August and early uh, September. This is based on data that I've back tested over the last hundred years of stock market uh, data. Many, many people say to me, well, how does this stuff still work? Uh, especially in, in exogenous kind of shocks like, like the ones that we experienced this year with the pandemic and with all the um, central bank intervention. Uh, but believe it or not, uh, this stuff can and it actually is still working right now because this, this worked perfectly 
um, in the last week of uh, August and early September, as we all know, uh, because that was the mini shakeout that, we, that just passed and may likely continue. Um, now, part of the reason why it worked perfectly so well this year is because we had a, a massive irrational exuberance into the month of August, uh, part of this midsummer rally, which actually uh, usually is strongest in July and then August, which then sets us up for the fourth crash cycle. And if you all recall the headline news, S&P 500 best August since 34 years. So we really had a grand finale in August. And the next question was, what do we do for an encore? Usually the encore is on the downside um, uh, in terms of seasonality, uh, negative seasonality, but this year more than any other year, uh, because we just had such a strong exuberance in the market from August. So we really should be uh, uh, resetting in for that uh, negative seasonality pattern, but then also that does naturally tie in with many of the concerns people have in terms of the presidential cycle, uh, in terms of potential future waves of the pandemic in the autumn winter season, um, and you know, uh, government support um, as we go into year end uh, for some of the initiatives that might be timing out um, right here and now. Well, let's let's uh, let's just move on and, and take a look at these these cycles. Then coinciding with the presidential cycle, of course, you've got your four year cycle. I know you also look at uh, some ten year cycles. How does this all fit in uh, with the uh, with the with the longer term cycles that have been established in the market? Yes. Yeah, so the, the the rhyme and reason as to why uh, my model and framework is, is bearish this year. Um, other than the, the, the trend exhaustion signals and, and various other um, uh, macro triggers, uh, the cycle work is, is showing uh, asymmetric uh, downside risk based on two key cycles, the 10-year cycle and the presidential four-year cycle. Um, and, and they're both bearish for this year. So those two cycles, the, the decennial 10-year cycle, uh, is the black uh, uh, um, um, shape on on the on the on the slide, and then the uh, red pyramid-like um, market beats is is this is the uh, presidential cycle. Combine the two, and you get the 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 overarching kind of uh, dash blue line, and that just shows you the the, the tidal wave or the grand super cycle uh, risk uh, for this year into next year. Decennial cycle is, is negative uh, for, for this year and next. The presidential cycle is all about this year and this year more than any other year because it's not just any presidential election. It's the second term presidential leader, which uh, uh, on average uh, produces a lame duck signal uh, because after two terms in power, that's usually when most presidents uh, and you can track this over over time uh, based on um, uh, U.S. presidential policy and, and what happens to the market, markets tend to underperform um, uh, significantly in into the election and, and usually slightly after the election. Uh, now, we're getting a 50-50 uh, split as to whether Trump or, or Biden win, but I think outside of who wins, um, there'll be further risks just in terms of the uh, gridlock in Congress um, and whether the, the, you know, the U.S. policymakers will actually be able to roll out further support to many distressed uh, um, uh, uh, society members. And let's remember it's, it's, it's a play between liquidity and insolvency and insolvency is the, the big elephant in the room risk, uh, which these cycles suggest are likely to um, unlock into year end and the new year. One final question, I want to bring back the S&P 500 on this, Ron, is how quickly all this is going to happen. We know from experience that when you get uh, sell-offs, and you can see it here uh, on this uh, S&P 500 chart from the uh, uh, pre-COVID levels all the way down to the lows that we had uh, uh, during the COVID pandemic, very sharp declines. Are you suggesting that we're going to get a similar sort of um, precipitous type sell-off? Is it all going to be done by the end of the year? Or are we expecting this Minsky moment to continue the pain uh, for those that want to take this market long? Are they going to suffer into 2021? Is it going to be a short trade right the way through until next year and into ne uh, next year's trade? Great question. And, and uh, based on the probabilities that I'm measuring, no certainties, of course, because we only find out until after the fact. The probabilities suggest that uh, we're going to have a Minsky moment in terms of the market turn, and that's what the, the whole moment uh, point is about, uh, a surprise trigger that will just uh, uh, unleash the market lower. Remember, in terms of price speed, uh, price acceleration is unsustainable in the short term. So 
you know, that will need to unfold just through the overbought, irrational nature of the market. Uh, but second to that, in terms of the actual uh, momentum that we've seen in the market, we've had five month, uh, consecutive monthly uh, uh, rises in, in, uh, in, in the market. So just as we have risen up for five months, back to back, we could easily mirror the, the same uh, acceleration, but but down. And I think that would not just be into year end, I think that would actually take us into the new year. Um, also, because I see a, a further volatility into uh, early to spring next year, that's another cycle point uh, on my framework. Um, so I don't think it'll be a straight line down, uh, but I do think we're going to have uh, certainly a Minsky moment here and now uh, as and when uh, the market turns uh, in this negative seasonality from September into October, most likely, and the US election in particular. Um, and then the second uh, extension of that, that risk would be early next year. So it could very well, in terms of uh, market shape, be a rolling W retest of the crash lows if you wanted to pin it down to a potential linear shape. Okay, excellent. Ron, look, thanks indeed for joining us, explaining all that in uh, some fine detail. Uh, and uh, Ron William is from RW Advisory, and you can catch up with him on his uh, Twitter address at RonWilliamRWA.